Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm John Phillips, the county supervisor uh, out in District 2. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, a summary in English and Spanish will be posted and sent out via social media, newsletter, and email. Um, I wanted to point out that District 2 office is open from Monday through Friday, uh, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, our number, call us anytime if you have an issue, 755-5022. Um, we haven't had uh, uh, a town hall meeting like this in a while. And uh, one of the things I've found out that COVID has really bashed us in the teeth over the last year, but at least uh, we've come up with this Zoom way of, of uh, conducting some businesses. And so it, it does make it a little easier for doing a business like this, especially where my district is, is as diverse as it is and spread out as much. So um, I've assembled a group of people that I'm going to introduce in a minute, and then I'll introduce individually as we go. Uh, this group uh, have the positions and we think to answer the issues that you may be bringing up and, and uh, uh, want to be answered. And so the important part, I think, of this is to hear a little bit what we have to say, but then the important part is is for you to ask the questions and so we can get you uh, uh, some of the information. And, and if for some reason we don't get to it, we don't get an answer for you, call my office uh, uh, first thing tomorrow or anytime thereafter. Um, with me tonight will be County Administrator Officer Charles McKee, uh, Monterey County Health uh, Director Elsa Jimenez, uh, Salinas Valley uh, Recycles, either Mandy Brooks or Patrick Matthews. Uh, waste Management will have Felipe Melcher and Kristen Cromie. Uh, environmental Health, Rich Ricardo Incarcionio. Monterey County Sheriff uh, Steve Burnell is here. Uh, Captain Kyle Foster of the uh, California Highway Patrol, the area commander is here, and uh, Monterey County Public Works Director Randy Ishin. Uh, and you can ask questions through the meeting using the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And they will be able to answer throughout the meeting. Uh, but to explain a little bit more how that works, I'm going to ask uh, Monica, my office, to do it because I don't understand exactly how it works. So, uh, Monica, you want to uh, tell them a little bit? Hi, yes, I have a, a, my screen share on. So, first of all, thank you for joining us. We will have a summary of this meeting in English and Spanish posted, and it'll go out via social media newsletter and email. Um, I have a screen here to kind of uh, show how you can ask questions throughout the meeting and afterward. So uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom and you can also raise your hand and that will be at the end of the meeting. If you are calling in, you can dial star nine to raise your hand and you're able to mute yourself and unmute yourself using star six. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the meeting, you can also send a chat. We can answer, the panelists will answer as they are able to. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. And Monica is with my office and uh, my chief of staff, uh, Josh Stratton, is on this too to uh, assist any way he can. Um, the, um, I'll make some comments uh, uh, throughout this evening, but I, I'll keep my comments uh, uh, and break them up a little bit and, and bring my comments in uh, when I'm introducing the various presenters and I'll bring my comments on the topics that they're going to be uh, addressing. Um, I, I just want to say, and I'll get to this in a little more detail, but COVID has is, is, uh, impacted all of us. You know, I'm close to 80 and I've never experienced anything like this in our lifetime. It's impacting our kids. It impacts uh, uh, us. It, uh, it, it We all, I think a lot of us who deal with depression a little bit uh, are, are struggling a little bit during this. Um, and especially for those uh, the, the, who um, are out of work uh, and waiting to go back to work uh, from COVID. So uh, it's been a long haul. Uh, we've been locked down a year, but things, uh, the positive things, if things are looking up, you hear uh, a lot more. And Elsa and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, we have a lot more vaccine than we did before. Our numbers are improving. Our hospitalizations are improving. So. Uh, like I said, I'll discuss this a lot more when uh, uh, Elsa, we ask her to say a few words. So 
starting off as uh, Charles McKee, our county administrator office. He, he's uh, only been with us for a year or so as a county administrator officer. But uh, before that, he was our county council for God knows how, how long. Uh, it really, he directly runs uh, the county departments, except for the elected. I don't want to get the sh sheriff uh, mad at me. Uh, while our board uh, makes the policy decisions. Uh, Charles uh, uh, is a very hands-on administrator, takes the time to attend public meetings like this and to uh, really help get things running smoothly. So Charles, uh, any comments you'd like to make as we go forward? Yeah, thank you, uh, Supervisor Phillips. And I certainly appreciate the opportunity to speak to uh, District 2 uh, constituents. Uh, one of the kind of one of the most important things uh, to know about District 2 is that they don't have any incorporated cities. There aren't any, there aren't any cities in District 2 uh, except, for, except for part of the city of Salinas. Uh, so the, most of the other supervisorial districts have uh, incorporated cities within their boundaries. And uh, what, what that means essentially is that, uh, that the, all the services that you get from government seem to come from a, a disjointed array of, of um, you know, the various governments that might serve uh, District 2. And uh, the, pro the, the, the overarching one is obviously the County of Monterey. Uh, as as uh, Judge Phillips, Supervisor Phillips was mentioning, I was the County Council for uh, uh, 17 years, I think it was, uh, for the County of Monterey. So I got a pretty good understanding of, of how things operated, but not uh, you know, not everything uh, it, from the same perspective. It was different uh, being able to just give my legal advice and and then uh, hand it off to my predecessor, uh, Dr. Bauman, Lou Bauman, and say, okay, now it's your problem. You got to figure it out. I'm just telling you what my advice is. Uh, so as the as the county administrative officer, I'm kind of I'm, I'm kind of like the the CEO for the county. But if you were to uh, create a county from scratch today, you wouldn't do it in the way it, it actually is, in my opinion, actually, the way it's grown up since 1850. Because we have, as uh, Supervisor Phillips was mentioning, you know, we have five elected board members, but we also have five elected uh, department head officials. The, the, so the sheriff is one of those five elected uh, office holders who run, a, who run a department. We also have five um, uh, uh, or actually over five, we have, I think, uh, seven or eight actually appointed uh, department heads are appointed by the Board of Supervisors. Uh, you have the county council, the county attorney. Uh, you have our, our Natividad Medical Center head. We have our uh, civil rights officer, our water resources agency uh, head. Um, uh, the public defender is appointed by the Board of Supervisors. Uh, the agricultural commissioner is appointed by the super, board of supervisors, and then there are others. Who, interestingly, are appointed by the board of supervisors uh, and may actually not report to the board. For example, the health officer of the county is appointed by the board of supervisors, but reports directly to Elsa Jimenez, our director of health. Uh, and so, my point is that we have 25 departments, roughly, that that serve the county, uh, but it's it's a strange conglomeration, uh, and so. Uh, it's hard enough for us to figure out who's in charge of what at the county. And so I know it must be very hard for the public to understand who does what, you know, who's in charge of what. Oh, and I forgot that the chief probation officer for the county is appointed by the judges of the Superior Court. Uh, but he works for the county as paid, paid by the county. And so it's a very, it's a very strange uh, animal, the way that the counties have grown up uh, since 1850. Uh, and so there isn't a mayor. There's no mayor of the county. Uh, there isn't even like a city manager in a city has a lot of authority. They, the city manager usually appoints everybody under the under the city. Uh, and, you know, you have a mayor and then the city manager. You just don't have that in the county. So uh, oftentimes what you'll do is you'll find uh, your supervisor and say, can you help me get to the right services? And he, he and his staff then try to figure out uh, who can help you in the county. And sometimes it might be, you know, it might be uh, me in my office. It might be the sheriff. It might be. Uh, the health department uh, could be the ag commissioner or the, the uh, veterans administration, or it could be somebody else. It could be uh, waste management. Oh, you'll hear, you know, you'll hear tonight that it might be another entity uh, or CHP or one of the other uh, government entities here. So uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. If I could share my screen just to also talk about where we are as far as uh, the county, as far as a budget, let me just show uh, where, what we have as a budget and it looks it looks um, uh, 
uh, pretty impressive. We have a, a, essentially a $1.6 billion budget. That's huge. Most of that money comes from um, uh, the state, this intergovernment, state and federal uh, uh, sources, this intergovernmental revenue. Those are state and federal sources and charges. Uh, and this other financing sources, that also includes a lot of state and federal monies. The monies that the board essentially has control over spending is right there, the, the, the local taxes. So going down, how is this broken up? You can see we have it broken up, the general government administration, a big chunk of it. That's how that, that kind of flows. And you look here at 98 million, that looks like a huge amount of money for the CAO's office. But a lot of that is covered in things like emergency services and fleet and contracts purchasing, and then holding on to things like the county strategic reserve so that we have a rainy day fund. Moving down, there's, there's uh, of course, a big pot for our libraries. We know that's important. Um, uh, public safety, it's a, it's a pretty broad category because we, we include the sheriff in with things like the Ag Commissioner uh, it, and the Resource Management Agency, which is now broken up into several departments under our public safety division here. Uh, health, uh, there's Elsa uh, along with the Natividad Medical Center uh, and they're, they're, our, they're our front line on COVID and our response to uh, uh, COVID-19 and all things trying to, to uh, beat that virus back. And then finally, our uh, other resources, recreation and culture. Uh, and a big part of that is, is uh, uh, Laguna Seca. And that's obviously a crown jewel for us. Uh, and here's how it kind of breaks down when you look at what, what we do with a dollar. Uh, public safety is a big part of that because we know that's a big part of what's important for the county. Health and safety and sanitation, public, uh, public assistance is obviously big. We wanna make sure that we have that safety net going. Small piece for education. Uh, and a little bit there in re recreation. Um, so in summary, our general, the general fund, uh, which, is, which is big, helps with the kind of that on the ground uh, resources that we wanna have for our community, but it doesn't necessarily include all the work that social services does, general assistance, or all the work that uh, El ELSA does with the health department. So that's my overview of the county and where the money comes from and where it goes. Uh, and I, what I, as I said, I know that, that uh, it can be very difficult for the community to understand how, how the county is set up and who does what. And, and oftentimes it can seem like we're, we're shifting it. If you come in for, uh, you have a problem with one service or another, we might be shifting you around to go to this department or that department. Uh, or to this agency or that agency, but the uh, understand that if you have any difficulties with that, if you swing back around to the supervisor's office, they can often help get you to the right spot. And if they can't, then you come to me and I can hopefully help uh, me or my staff, we can help you get to the right, to the right uh, uh, agency. And it might not be Monterey County that, that, that helps you. It might be some, one of our partners here that we're gonna uh, talk to tonight. Uh, okay. Supervisor Phillips, back to you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, just on that budget, just make sure you keep the money flowing north. Uh, you know, I, I don't like the, all going over to the rich people over in the peninsula and, and down south. So um, before I introduce Elsa, uh, uh, it's no one's had their hands fuller than Elsa has uh, this past year, uh, but it's been a frustrating year for our county, uh, more so than most. We've been locked down almost uh, one of the few counties that have been locked down almost the entire year. Uh, and this, it's based on the state of California, the metrics that they come up with. And they control the tiers that we're in and accordingly uh, control what businesses can be operating in, in our county. Uh, the state metrics, I got to say, have not been kind to Monterey County. Uh, I, I, it, I don't know why it's kind of a perfect storm, but and their metrics, uh, it's frustrating at times because they keep changing a bit when <laughs> they move the goalpost on us. And, and uh, a lot of times without much for loan and our citizens are asking, well, what, what's going on? Why, why did this happen? And uh, um, we've sought some relief uh, and adjustments usually to not getting us very far, but we did fight for it. And I'd hoped at this point that the state would say, okay, well, you've crust and you're coming down from the curve and relate some control back to the local county, uh, uh, individual counties, and give our local entities a little more flexibility in how to control and, and deal with our particular issues that 
maybe elude the state. But having said that, um, there's a lot of positive news. Uh, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, the numbers are down considerably. You look at what was 27 today, I think, and, and me, we're, we're, we were at times four or 500 uh, a day. Hospitalizations are down uh, and people in hospitals on COVID. And three months ago, boy, we get the reports every week of uh, how many people are in the, in, the, in the four hospitals in this county. And it was, it was scary. And so that's such good news to see where our hospitals are. Um, and vaccine, initially, I don't think we got treated just right on our vaccine. I think uh, our county got shorted and we yelled and screamed about that, uh, Elsa louder than anybody. And, and we have, that has been corrected. And so we're getting um, more vaccine, almost double the dosage uh, and getting back where we should have been. And if you saw, we got some vaccine specially directed after we brought to the attention that the farm workers and, and their uh, migrant farm workers, a lot of them aren't counting to our various populations that we're counting. And uh, so we were able to get 5,000 doses a week coming in to, for the farm workers. They're going to do a 3,000 uh, dose uh, mass evacuation uh, of that, of vac vaccination at the rodeo grounds this Saturday. Um, and I'm hoping uh, in the next week or so to get uh, enough vaccine to do all the North County teachers and the uh, uh, people that are taking care of the little kids uh, and get that done. And I'd like to arrange uh, uh, and work with the, the entities to get some mass vaccination uh, sites here in uh, North County. Um, and I would emphasize to you, that as soon as you're eligible to get a vaccine, get it, no matter which one it is. Uh, and if you have trouble getting that, call my office. Uh, though a lot of us aren't familiar with the internet, myself included. And, uh, and our office works with those people, especially the older ones that aren't uh, as equipped. But any of you who uh, need help on getting signed up, call my office. Uh, we've probably got over at least over 100 people signed up uh, during the past three weeks. Um, it looks to me like we'll be able to move in the red and reopen soon. Uh, I think that's really important. The things that uh, I feel strongly about, we got to get our kids back to school. Uh, we got to get indoor dining uh, uh, opened up. Uh, I didn't think it was, there was, those were with the protocols in place. I didn't think the indoor dining was uh, contributing to, to this at all. Health clubs and the other ones. So, one last thing I want to uh, emphasize, and that's the importance of continuing testing. I know all of us got burnt out, and we said, "Well, I'll just wait for the, uh, I'll just wait for the vac vaccine," and uh, that's hurting us. Uh, here in Casterville, we were doing eight, nine hundred, something like that, right, Elsa? And and we're down to like one eighteen. You can walk right in here at the library in Casterville anytime and and get tested without without anything. And testing is important because the, the state adjusts the uh, positivity rate based on testing. And uh, we had a mathematician, a, a good businessman who studied all this, and he, he thought we, we would be in red uh, and out of the purple if we had another 150 uh, tests a day in, in Monterey County, in the entire Monterey County. So it's real critical. Uh, I emphasize that. I know the feeling, well, I'll just wait for it. But it's real important that we do the testing uh, and continue to do that uh, even multiple times. So with that, I want to introduce Elsa Jimenez. She's been uh, with the health department for a long time. How long have you been health director, Elsa? Uh, five years, and I've been with the county for 20 We got a, a, a little glitch in that one. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear yeah, me? Now, now I can. And uh, she, as I mentioned before, no one's had more on their hands and, and on their back than during the COVID uh, health impact. So I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. I know you're um, everywhere these days. And the important thing about Elsa for us out here is she's 
a North County resident. So, uh, Elsa, you want to talk a little bit about uh, COVID and where we're going? I appreciate yes, it. Yes, definitely. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I want to just commend the residents of Supervisor Phillips District that he does listen to what we say, and he definitely advocates for the community. And so he took many of my talking points, so I hope to go through this really quickly. Next slide. As um, Next slide. As uh, Supervisor Phillips, this uh, today's data actually shows 42,362 cases. We have 40 individuals hospitalized. And unfortunately, we've lost 329 of our uh, neighbors, loved ones in our county due to COVID. And we've tested uh, almost 225,000 uh, tests have been processed for the county of Monterey. And our turnaround times, again, are much quicker. Right now, you can get a test relatively easily, and you should be getting your results in it within the next day or two days. Next slide. I wanted to just highlight for you North County statistics. So in North County, we, uh, we have about 10.69% of our cases and you can see on this uh, table here, it's represented by a zip code. Um, it is the region with the least percentage of COVID in our uh, Monterey County region. Next slide. This is an epidemiological curve that really shows the trend over time. With respect to COVID, you can see um, actually March 16th was the first day that we reported our first COVID, but after further look back, it was actually a little bit earlier in March. And so we're coming up to our one year anniversary as uh, Supervisor Phillips alluded when our local health officer, Dr. Ed Moreno uh, implemented his uh, stay at home or shelter in place order. And you can see we thought, oh, sorry, go back to the next slide. We thought that, uh, wrong way. <laughs> Uh, we thought that we had it bad in the summer and um, definitely we did. But as you can see here with the holidays uh, nearing in November and December and January that many residents do uh, what they wanted to do in terms of gathering with loved ones and family. As you can imagine, after many, many months of being sheltered and isolated, uh, individuals gathered and unfortunately we saw our biggest peak um, in our COVID transmission. But fortunately, since about mid-January, we are seeing a steady decline. Next slide. This is uh, again a curve representing the number of individuals that are hospitalized in our county. And again, it corresponds with uh, the time that uh, we had our highest peak. And as of the last date we reported, it was 38. But as I mentioned, today's data shows uh, 40 individuals are currently hospitalized due to COVID. Next. This is the blueprint metric that really uh, shows where we are in these tiers. Um, the last data we have reported is for February 20th. And you can see that our case rate, uh, our adjusted case rate was 10.1, meaning we're still in the purple. Our test positivity rate was at 4.6 or the orange or tier three. And then our uh, positivity rate for the census tracts in the lowest quartile of the Healthy Places Index was at about 8.1 or the purple tier. Next. This shows again over time. And as you can see, since early January, we're seeing a very nice decline in the number of uh, cases. Um, what I, I think you skipped a slide, um, Monica. Oh no, go back. Okay, that's fine, go ahead. Um, you can see right here that the goal is to bring these two lines closer together. If we can get both of these lines below in the red tier, then that's one metric that uh, will help us move forward. Additionally, our adjusted case rate right now is 10.1, but our actual case rate was 10. And as Supervisor Phillips alluded to earlier, there is an adjustment that is take that is factored in. If we are not meeting the statewide average for testing, then we get penalized. So our actual a, a case rate was 10, but the adjusted is 10.1. So please utilize the testing resources that are available to you if you are feeling sick or if you're uh, close contact to somebody. Next slide. And as you can see here, this is uh, the test positive test positivity rate, as I mentioned earlier, the goal is if we can get both of these in the red and the other metric in the red, we can progress. Or if we can get both of these in the orange and the other one in the red, that also gives us an opportunity to progress. 
Uh, we have to be in that lower level tier for three weeks before we can actually implement uh, what is permissible in that red tier. Next. Uh, the, uh, if you go onto our website, you will see all of the testing services available. I will tell you that in the beginning of January, our Castorville Library site, we had uh, about 825 specimens that were processed per week. And uh, end of February, we were down to a low of 107. We can process up to 825 tests uh, in a week over in our Castorville site. And so we do encourage everybody, if you're feeling sick or you're close contact to somebody, to please um, go ahead and uh, access that free service to you. Next slide. I want to point out why vaccination is important. In the top chart here, you see two individuals that are not immunized, that are sick and contagious, and the blue people are all the people that um, are not immunized, but they're healthy. It, two individuals being infectious can really infect a community as a whole. When we achieve herd immunity, which is about 80% of our residents being vaccinated, and in our situation, we're looking at needing about 514,000 doses of the two dose uh, vaccine that is currently available, the Pfizer and the Moderna, to be able to vaccinate at least 80% of our 16 years of age and older. And you can see you have two uh, infectious individuals, but again, transmission is very low because most individuals are immunized. So this is uh, the goal that we are trying to achieve by rolling out vaccination. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, currently, we are following California's COVID-19 vaccination plan. As of yesterday, we are uh, now vaccinating, uh, continuing to vaccinate people in phase 1A, which is persons uh, who work in healthcare, residents of long-term facilities, and we have expanded fully into phase 1B, which is every person 65 and older, regardless of where you live in the county, you are now eligible to get a vaccine, as well as every resident in the county who works in the food and agriculture, child care and education, or emergency services. I will tell you that we have over 200,000 individuals that in our county are eligible under phase 1B. Next slide. This is uh, showing a change over time. The next big change for us is coming March 17th, all individuals in our county who are 16 to, six, 16 to 64 years of age with a medical condition or disability that puts them at higher risk for morbidity and mortality will also be eligible. Uh, we're hoping that individuals will with, work with their primary care provider and hopefully get their vaccine at their primary care provider's clinic uh, if they are deemed to be eligible uh, come March 17th. Next slide. Uh, so there are multiple ways to access a vaccine. As Supervisor Phillips said, you could call his office and his staff will help you uh, schedule a vaccine. Uh, you can call your physician and see if the, uh, your primary care provider is making this service available. Uh, you can call 211 as well if you need assistance with scheduling. And you can also go on to our mcvaccinate.org website where you will see a list of various community clinics that are either sponsored by any of our area hospitals that are by our public health bureau or um, of the several pharmacies that we have in our community that are also making vaccination available. Next slide. In terms of the number of doses of vaccine that have come into our county, uh, we've been allocated almost 92,000, but of that only uh, 76,670 have actually been received uh, by our uh, local health department. And of those we've administered about 59% according to the state uh, immunization registry system. So right now we are uh, at uh, approximately 15% of our eligible residents have been vaccinated. Next slide. I wanted to show you um, in terms of where the residents who've been vaccinated live, and this is really only representative of the information uh, where the people's uh, zip code has actually been entered into the system. So that you can see here uh, in North County, that we've had 11% of our COVID-19 cases. Uh, we represent 12% of Monterey County's population, but have only received 9% of uh, the vaccine. 
compared to the peninsula where there are only 13% of the cases, 31% of the total population yet have received 44% of the vaccine allocation. And then lastly, I'll pick on South County. You know, there are 30% of our COVID cases that make only 18% of the Monterey County residents yet have only received 11% of the vaccines. And so we do recognize, your board does recognize and advocates that we need to ensure that we are equitably distributing the vaccine to those communities that are most impacted, that have the highest incidence rate, and unfortunately have had the uh, greatest proportion of deaths. Next slide. This is a breakdown by zip code for North County. Um, you can see that 93907 um, has received the bulk of the vaccine that's come into this jurisdiction with uh, the smaller jurisdictions uh, receiving less. And again, uh, you can see here that uh, we have some work to do in North County in terms of increasing vaccine, particularly in 95012, which is Castorville area. Next slide. Uh, this is another data slide where uh, we represent the race and ethnic group that individuals have self-identified uh, for this data. And I'll just point out that, you know, our Hispanic or Latinx uh, proportion of those that are 65 and less, the sec second column, are 63% of our residents uh, who are less than 65 years of age identify as Latinx, yet have only received 43% of, of the doses. Um, next slide. And so what are we doing to try to help some of our residents who have technology challenges, language challenges, perhaps transportation challenges? Um, the county um, um, is working with uh, many organizations locally here to create a community health worker support team. Um, they're doing outreach, education, engagement. They're making sure that if people uh, don't know the resources, if they're afraid of not receiving replacement income, if they were to get a positive result back, they're linking these individuals with the necessary uh, resources. Um, they're going door to door, they're calling individuals. And so it's a very active group. I think, uh, next slide, we have almost 100 individuals that have been identified and trained um, who are strategically located throughout uh, Monterey County, again, in those areas of greatest concern. So like Castroville, Pajaro um, for the places in North County. Uh, this was a $4.9 million investment by your Board of Supervisors to ensure that the individuals most impacted and with the greatest barriers um, have a, uh, an ability to be able to access the resources that they need to be able to um, uh, safely isolate, for example, if they were to uh, come um, have a positive result for COVID. Next slide. And this is just the last slide. If you have any information, we do welcome questions. And uh, I want to thank my team at the health department. Dr. Ed Moreno is probably the one who's been uh, more engaged in COVID response efforts as our uh, local health officer. You know, ultimately, he is the one who is tasked with uh, doing um, everything that we need to do to be able to save lives and ensure that uh, services and resources are going to those uh, most impacted. Um, and I'll take questions at the end or through the chat, I will answer them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Elsa, don't go away. I'm sure they're going to have some questions for you. Um, who, um, we have uh, Salinas Valley Solid Waste uh, Authority uh, next. Um, who's going to, uh, uh, we have we have the boss there, Patrick uh, <laughs> Matthews. Uh, yeah. he, he's a local expert on recycling uh, from different technologies you use, and he's done a lot of work on uh, on the process. Uh, and he, I think it's important that he discuss the details of SB 1383 and and some of the uh, uh, some of the issues that, that that's going to create for our county. Uh, he he runs the Slings Valley Solid Waste Authority, and and I'm on that authority with him and. Uh, while while I'm on it, before I get to uh, garbage pickup has one, been one of the most common calls we get. Uh, it's it's one of my pet peeves, but uh, for a lot of other our residents, it's, it, it's also and so uh, we get a lot of calls at our office, uh, uh, and we refer them on to public works. And for that reason, and I, and I don't know how much uh, information we ever got out to you, our citizens, but. Uh, uh, we contracted with an independent contractor, and uh, that was in partnership with Salinas Valley uh, Solid Waste Authority with, with his organization in Monterey Regional. Uh, and 
we were concerned that we weren't doing a good enough job of picking up the, especially the big items, the mattresses, the, the refrigerators, the, the uh, televisions that are thrown along the side. And so uh, we've contracted with Smith and Enright uh, and they're a local outfit and they actually have a, one of their yards is right there on San Miguel Canyon Road. And uh, they're, uh, uh, their their issue is, and what we want them to do is get out there as soon as they can when we get the call in uh, to go pick up the big items uh, that we get called in. And so um, I, I'm out on the road all the time and I'm calling my office all the time. There's, there's a, uh, a big bag of trash here. There's things. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it to the, to Randy uh, when he gets there to, to give more details about the, program but if nothing else call my office we'll get the we'll get the call in try to give us as much information about cross cross street so we can uh zero in on it and make it a little easier for them um another thing that we've been done on what we're talking about the trash issue is we did a a, a pretty good job of working now uh, with the Castleville pedestrian bridge cleanup uh, under the railroad tracks. And that is a difficult thing to do because uh, we have to work with Union Pacific to clean up the trash. And so we've been working on that. Uh, Josh Stratton from my office has been working with uh, the assistant from uh, Congressman Pranetta's office to connect with Union Pacific to do the work. Uh, we have to get their permission to do that. Uh, and uh, there has been other cleanup. Uh, I, I got to commend our community that we had the Casserville cleanup. They had a number of those uh, that I came out and saw uh, people doing it. But we had the Pajaro cleanup. We did the river and the Pajaro. And other uh, individual organizations have been working to pick off a particular road to, to clean up because uh, they're so concerned about it. So I, I do thank all the citizens that will are willing to get in and roll up their sleeves and, and, and help keep our county clean. So with that, uh, Patrick, uh, uh, your comments, please. Yes. Um, well, good evening, everybody. and appreciate you all participating in this meeting. It's always a great opportunity uh, for our agency to, you know, speak directly to you on some of these issues around recycling and garbage and resource recovery. Uh, so I'm Patrick Matthews. I'm general manager, chief administrative officer for Salinas Valley Recycles. Um, I have on, on the meeting with me, uh, Mandy Brooks, who is our resource recovery manager. Uh, her role is actually to run a lot of these programs uh, around recycling, resource recovery. Uh, and her staff also has an oversight and coordinating role with all of the garbage companies like Waste Management tonight. Um, and so we wanna commend all the hauling companies j just at the start because they, this is a difficult job for them. Um, Collecting, especially in rural counties, uh, it takes a lot of coordination and work. And I know they're working hard to try to solve the problems uh, that we're seeing out there. Um, so I'll start with uh, really the one item that's in front of our agency and really in front of all agencies and jurisdictions in California. And it is a bill passed several years ago called SB 1383. Um, the abbreviated version of that bill is, is it requires and mandates um, that uh, all jurisdictions recover and divert 75% of the organic material that is still going into uh, our garbage. So that includes food waste, paper, uh, yard waste that didn't get put in the green bin, uh, and those types of things. So our agency's primary role uh, is providing the infrastructure to support all of those mandates. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll be candid. The mandates uh, are unfunded. Uh, they're very significant. While they have uh, noble goals to reduce uh, greenhouse gases and, and short-lived pollutants like methane, uh, the reality is uh, that the, the way those regulations are written uh, require a community effort, uh, not just our agency, but an effort from the haulers, from the citizens and the businesses, uh, from our member agencies, the Salinas Valley cities and the county to all uh, join hands and participate in making this work. Because at the end of the regulatory process, which we're uh, a good year and a half into, um, uh, there will be uh, mandated enforcement. 
And I, I hate to say that, but it is a state regulation uh, that is going to require that we uh, begin to look at the generation of waste and to make sure that people are participating in the program. So between our agency providing the infrastructure to compost and ship and grind and make landscape products uh, from materials that you, the organic material you recycle, uh, there also will be an enhanced effort by our haulers to uh, expand the amount of material they collect. Uh, things like food waste will be added to the list in the very near future. New programs for commercial businesses uh, that will unfortunately have to be mandated. Uh, the state has uh, given us no leeway on this. Um, if we don't enforce and mandate and implement these programs, then they will go after the individual jurisdictions uh, with um, uh, penalties. So it's unfortunate that it is such a, a stringent set of laws, um, but they are coming. And we want to take this opportunity just to let you know these this is a community effort that we all have to participate in. And we're looking for a lot of community feedback as we start to roll out new ideas, new programs, new educational efforts to try to bring everybody along and participate in these programs. Um, but the good news on the backside is it'll make our landfills last longer. It'll reduce our dependence on landfills. And there are some very great things that we're doing our agency and others uh, with that material we're recovering not only making products to enhance our agricultural soils and improve our landscapes, but also making uh, a methane and, and natural gas, biogas, that can be used to uh, run our, our, on, uh, our fleets and to provide energy for um, other projects. So uh, there, is a, there is a good side to this effort by the state, um, but it will take a lot of effort on our parts. So I don't know, Mandy, if uh, you would like to uh, add any words to that, um, please do. Um, no, I, I think you pretty much uh, covered it, just that there is, I think you, you mentioned this, there is a significant amount of monitoring, reporting, uh, and tracking that 1383 requires. So while I understand there's been issues with the smart check roll, rollout, it will actually be of particular importance going forward with 1383 in terms of monitoring and compliance and enforcement. So um, it's a nice segue into um, kind of how new programs will be rolled out and um, how much more enforcement will happen with recycling and uh, waste reduction programs. So thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, and, and what people don't realize is we get these mandates <laughs> from the state and, and they're sitting, some of them are like this are very significant, but there's no funding that goes with them. Uh, and, and then we as a county have to figure out how we scrounge around to find the money to do the programs that we're mandated to do. So uh, next, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, waste management. Uh, we have Felipe Melcher here and uh, Kristen Felipe's the district director and Kristen's uh, the public sector manager. but. I, I asked them to be here to answer a few questions about concerns and, and they know I've been getting a, a fair number of calls at my office and I've been um, chatting with them about a little bit about their smart truck technology and people feeling that they uh, got the wrong notice on the wrong thing, especially the people who have six or seven uh, people up the road all bring their down. You got six or seven uh, trash containers right next to each other. Uh, and uh, uh, I got to say, waste management is taking steps uh, when we talked to them to reduce the amount of uh, wrongful letters. And uh, we were still receiving some calls there. So that's why we asked them to be here. I was at breakfast at my uh, country kitchen uh, a couple of weeks ago in Prunedale. And uh, uh, about half the people there uh, had received the letters and were uh, were were getting on me, roasting me, and my the, the guy that owned the restaurant almost wouldn't wouldn't uh, pour me my coffee uh, about it. So uh, my my concern is some of the calls we get in, people are upset, and they said, "Well, if I'm not recycling right, I'll just quit recycling. Everything goes to, it will go into the garbage, and that's not what we want." And then some other ones are saying, 
uh, well, I'll just go back and I, I'll quit the service and I'll go back like we did in Prunedale every every month or month and a half. You loaded up your, your truck and you went to the dump, but that just causes more stuff, more vehicles going into the dump, more emissions. And um, usually the 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 amateur haulers uh, aren't uh, don't have it covered the right way. And so it's more trash on the, uh, on the highway. So uh, that's why we asked uh, Kristen and Filippi to chat with us a little bit. So uh, Kristen or Filippi. Good evening, Supervisor. Um, th thank you for, for having me tonight. And I know it's uh, not an easy path to clear for us. Um, I'll give a little context and background. I've been with uh, waste and serving the community for 20 years. Uh, over the last 10 years, you know, we've collected over 721,000 tons of, of refuse and about another 250,000 tons of, of recycling material. So we've been in uh, the county for some time and we, we've done our best to try to collect the material and get, get it to the processor um, or one of the JPAs that, that take the material um, so that we could have the best price reasonable. So last year, we rolled out a new program in Monterey County to help reduce the recycling and the yard waste contamination while also trying to reduce the litter in the community. Um, and, and we felt that, that the two items we really needed to connect with was the overfills of, of one's container and getting the appropriate size, and then also the correct materials into either your blue container or your green waste container. One would be for your recycle and one for your trash. Um, and use the technology that we have in today's era to try to harness it and, and grasp it. Um, so our ask was to please don't overfill your carts and place items in the recycling and yard waste carts uh, that, that is the correct material. Um, and lastly, we've been asking the community to be patient that if uh, during this process we, we erroneously build you or sent the wrong information over that we would take the time to, to make those corrections. And, and we've done a really good job to, to, to prevent that from happening. And then we also went back and found the problem with the common set out location. So we've gone back and we've exempted a lot of those customers from the common set out location until uh, we can either mark their cans correctly uh, for the correct location or we just will leave them exempted if we're gonna to continue to have issues with the set out locations. So that's a little bit of background of what we've been working on. We started communications uh, last year. So um, as Patrick met, mentioned earlier, um, we're working as, as a community, not only um, the patrons, um, but also the landfills, um, the processing locations for the recycling, um, and, and us as the haulers and working with the county to try to meet the 1383 goals. And that, that will require container audits to reduce contamination in the recycle and the yard waste elimination of organics from the trash as Patrick mentioned earlier. Um, and we're using technology. Uh, the trucks are equipped with um, uh, cameras and uh, every stop is linked to a customer in a database. And then every cart lift and its contents captured on camera and then images are audited uh, for overages and contamination, and then a notification out to the customer. Next slide, please. Um, the overage audit process, and, and this is what our folks in indoor are doing, and that's the, the auditors that, that are tasked with looking at the photos. Uh, as you can see, photos there, those, those are you know, what would be considered overfilled. Um, so a trained auditor, auditor reviews still photos that are taken prior to the cart lift. Uh, the overage is recorded if the lid is lifted up. And then overage fees applies for trash, overfills to trash, recycling and organics and green waste. And then also a notification to the customer via email or text. Next slide, please. The contamination audit process. Um, so we have an established list of not acceptable materials and recyclables and compostables. and I've been here since the single stream rolled out in 2010, and, and that list has varied. It, it's changed um, dramatically from what we collected in 2010 to 2021. So just having the right locations and, and knowing what materials are going in what container would greatly help this process. Um, the first review, the trained auditor reviews footages of the cart uh, content. 
Um, and then a second review is identified um, if there's contaminants ver verified by the first auditor would be verified by a second auditor. And then again, a notification to the customer via email or text. And the top contaminants um, that usually go into the recycle and green waste is uh, plastic or bag material, um, which is causing the contamination and really makes it difficult for processing um, at the JPA. So we ask to please keep all the film plastic out of the recycle and out of the yard waste carts. Next slide, please. Um, here is an example of, of what the auditor is viewing. And you know, we're just looking for things that would be considered not recyclable. And as you can see, we have two plastic bags, um, old pillows um, that are not considered recyclable con uh, material that would essentially go into your trash can. Next slide, please. Okay, everyone. Uh, good evening. My name is Kristen Scromi. I'm the public sector manager with waste management. And I wanted to uh, review some recycling facts in Monterey County uh, to become familiar with uh, where, where our recycling is going. Um, all of our recyclables are sent to the Monterey Regional Waste Management District in Marina to be processed. It was recently found that uh, the contamination level in the recycling or uh, the trash level in the recycling uh, increased from 22% in 2019 to 30% in 2020. So trash is on the rise. Um, we're seeing a lot more trash in the recycling. What does this mean? Uh, we believe that residents need more information about accepted recyclables and that education is the key to reduce the processing costs. I'd like to talk a little bit more about um, how we rolled out information about Smart Truck. We did include information about uh, the new program in our newsletter that came with the October 1st invoices. Additionally, we sent a postcard in November before the program went live in December. There was information about keeping the lid completely closed and how to recycle right, keeping plastic bags um, out of the recycle and out of the yard waste. Additionally, a sorting guide was sent on the back of a FAQ sheet information page about the program. And um, we think these tools are helpful and more tools are on the way to help you um, avoid those, those contamination or overage notices. Now I wanna talk about the main issue that North Monterey County is experiencing. We have a lot of group set out locations in North County where folks bring down their carts down to the main road um, and are, are collected all at once by our, our driver. And our technology has been, you know, triggering these not my bin issues where you're receiving notices for your neighbor's cart. Um, I just want to take a moment to say waste management apologizes for the oversight and community stops or group set out locations in North Monterey County. We've exempted and credited these group stop customers from the program. So if you bring your carts down to the uh, main part of the road to be collected, you've been exempted from the program. And if you've been charged incorrectly, we'd be more than happy to, to remove those charges. Our drivers are auditing group set out locations and marking carts with addresses to prevent this issue from repeating. If you received a letter for your neighbor's cart, Waste management will temporarily exempt your account from the program while we research the source of the error and correct it. We know there's a lot of illegal dumping in our county. And um, if, if you experience illegal dumping, um, please give us a call. Um, we recommend bringing your containers out in the morning uh, before service because a lot of illegal dumping happens in the evening at night. Um, please contact our customer service uh, so that we can review the incident. Um, we don't want to charge you if, if you've been illegally dumped into. And then additionally, we've heard that the letters we're sending out are missing images of the overage or contamination. Um, if the image is missing from your letter or the image is too blurry, a credit will be issued um, to you. And we just want to take a moment to say we're really sorry for um, this oversight and we do want to make things right with the North Monterey County residents. 
We are sending new brochures um, to everyone in the county. So keep an eye out for these. And this tells you what to place in the trash, the recycle, the yard waste. The main thing is to keep plastic bags out of both the recycle and yard waste. The only exception is uh, shredded paper you can place in a clear bag and a tied knot um, to contain that material. And then we have some local resources in Monterey County. Um, you can visit whatgoeswhere.info to find out what is recyclable, what goes in the trash, yard waste, and recycling. And um, give us a call if you still have a smart truck issue. Um, we want to be able to resolve your issue right away. And again, we're very sorry, but we believe that SB 1383 and Smart Truck Program will help us uh, bring us all into compliance with the auditing um, of visuals of everyone's cards. So thank you so much for this opportunity. We look forward to hearing your questions at the end. All right. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, and, and I think that is important to get the information out about what is recyclable and what isn't because like so many of us got used to plastic bags and things. So I know my uh, my wife and I, uh, we argue, uh, is that going, should that go in the bag or that going in, in the other one? So uh, we, 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 we do have that a little bit. So thank you. Uh, next, uh, 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 Ricardo uh, is acting bureau chief of environmental health and they deal with uh, our, our water wells and they deal with our septic tanks and they deal with a little bit of everything, but uh, uh, Ricardo, uh, any comments that you have, please. Thank you, Supervisor Phillips. Uh, Rick Incarnacion, Environmental Health Acting Bureau Chief. Thank you everybody for um, allowing me to be with your town hall tonight, it's a great pleasure. Um, we're from Environmental Health. We're, we're more commonly known as the health inspectors for the county. And um, if you'd like to tell you like directly, we, we work directly and very closely with District 2, Supervisor Phillips, um, I can tell you firsthand, whenever there's a request from your from your community and it comes down from uh, Supervisor Phillips' office, we work closely with Josh, uh, Claudia, and Monica to make sure that services are provided and that we get the job done. Um, like what Supervisor uh, Phillips mentioned and all the previous speakers um, with regards to um, waste and debris, there are several services that are provided um, as the uh, Environmental Health Bureau, we regulate um, various programs, including the landfills. Um, there was some mention about SB 1383, which is pretty huge. That's a big program. You're going to hear a lot more about it. And uh, even uh, the items that Felipe and Kristen were, were talking about, it's closely related to this. And it, it's, it's multi-layered and it's pretty complex. but. Uh, as part of the Environmental Health Bureau, we also hope to, to push out information so that people aren't blindsided um, with these requirements. And the true meaning of it, which is not only preserving the landfills, but there's a lot more to it. I, I've been answering questions in the chat box and, and, and uh, monitoring it. There's a lot of questions about recycling. Where does the plastic go now that China doesn't take it? Um, even recycling manure, these are all great questions and everybody start, needs to start thinking about it. There was a question about food recycling and that's, that's another huge thing. This 1383 talks about distribution of food and not wasting food, trying to connect it to charitable services. Um, also talks about compost, composting and, and organic recycling. And this, this, um, this new law is, is not only about organics, but it's about preserving the quality of your air. Um, so there's a lot that environmental health touches. Again, like I mentioned, we're the health inspectors for the county. Many of, many of you may know that we do restaurant inspections. Um, we also uh, regulate hazardous materials. Um, we have a program for cannabis. Uh, we do have a program for recycling resource recovery. We work very closely with Patrick Matthews and his team as well as his counterpart, Tim Flanagan from the, from the uh, uh, district. Um, the movement of solid waste is, a, is one of the major programs in the county. Addressing illegal dumping and littering is another program. We, we work, I see Margie Kay in the, in, is one of the participants. We work very closely with, with the community. And a lot of it is about education. 
Um, in the Environmental Health Bureau, we issue health permits, we issue violations and notices, um, but a lot of it is based primarily on education first. And um, it's, it's something that would be ongoing, something as simple as hand washing, all the way up to something as complex as organics recycling. Um, th these are some of the things that we, we address. Supervisor Phillips mentioned water. Another huge issue that environmental health uh, deals with. Again, as the health inspectors, we're dealing with water quality. Is, is the quality of the water good? There was a question about um, water quantity and uh, we do have some requirements for that, but addressing water quantity and drought, you know, and during times of not drought, people don't think about it, but we have to constantly think about it. Um, so uh, we'll try to answer questions in the Q&A as, as close as possible. Um, and uh, if there is, um, I'll, I'll be available for questions and uh, I will put, um, oh, there was another question about the garbage pickup program. So environmental health does receive those requests for garbage pickup because we were part of that bridge program between uh, Public Works and Randy Ishii will talk about it for the litter pickup program. So we, we are managing that contract with Smith and Enright. Once that contract runs through, it, it's, it's part of the, the the bigger system for garbage pickup uh, in the county. All right, thank you, Rick. Um, next, uh, we have our sheriff, and I think he has Commander Thornburg uh, with him too. Um, one of the issues uh, I know we get hit with out here in North County is uh, noise and the loud parties uh, that go on late at night, especially the ones that concern us the most are the ones that have uh, continuing parties at a certain location. And uh, we worked uh, uh, with the uh, County Council's office to redraft the noise ordinance to try to make it uh, uh, more user friendly. Uh, but but it's it's it can be a challenge for uh, deputies when uh, uh, they get the loud noise call, but in the middle of the night when they have a lot of other calls. And so uh, they've been working on that. And uh, they've been working with code enforcement. And in fact, a, a couple recently, uh, uh, we had a report of uh, during the COVID of a loud party. And uh, I think the sheriff's department's working made the report and it's got it to the code enforcement. Um, so uh, I don't think we've had near as many loud parties during COVID, uh, which is a good thing. But when they do have them uh, and you have the party and the rest of us are all locked down and they're there. And uh, I know I've called the sheriff a couple of times myself because uh, you see the loud party and they're having no mask and they're not social distancing and they, they're dancing and party going on. It's, uh, that's not right. So uh, that's one of the issues we face, but Sheriff Brunel, thank you for being here. Thank you, Supervisor Phillips. Thank you for having us. Um, brought my wingman with me today. I'm gonna turn it over to him in just a minute, but I'd, I'd like to start off by saying, uh, you know, I can't wait for the day to where we can get together in a town hall meeting and talk face to face and you can shake your hands again and, and, you know, we could step off to the side and talk about, you know, particular issues. But, you know, until then, this is the next best thing. So, um, you know, it's good we have at least a, a way to communicate with you. Um, you know, as Supervisor Phillips mentioned, one of the top things uh, in, in this district is the noise complaints. And believe me, I've, I've had neighbors, I've lived in places my entire life where we've had neighbors that aren't very considerate of their, of their neighbors and play music at all hours of the night. They play, they, they crank it up to 10 and, um, you know, they don't, they don't care how it affects their neighbors. So we're doing, you know, uh, working with the ordinance, it, it's helped us out. It's given us a little more teeth to work with with uh, with your neighbors to get them to turn the music down, um, so uh, we are working with resource management agency and, and Chief Thornburg will explain how that process works. But there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes that 
when you report these loud music calls, a lot of you don't realize what's happening, but there's there's a lot going on behind the scenes. And when you report these, uh, and especially you know if you report them online, even uh, and I know loud music calls don't typically get reported online, but if there's a, a problem area that keeps occurring over and over again, and you do report those problem areas online, uh, we do read those and um, we do address those the best we can. So, um, you know, and other other issues, you know, homeless issues, we, we try to address those before they get out of hand. Um, so uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Chief Thornburg here. He's uh, He deals with this on a day in day out basis. Um, I will say, you know, with the COVID issue, our uh, every COVID death is a reportable death to the coroner's office, which is our office on, on the sheriff corner of Monterey County. And we had a 40% a increase in deaths this past year or so. That tells you how serious uh, this virus and this pandemic is. Uh, you know, I, I, I had the virus back in December and I tell you, it was two weeks of not very much fun and glad I got through it, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's real and it's serious. So we, uh, you know, we are out there, we're still educating people, tell them, you know, even, even though the numbers look like they're getting better, you still need to wear your mask, especially when you're, you know, in, in a gathering of people. And uh, it's sometimes it's sad that we have to tell grown adults that you have to wear a mask or you have to, you have to not gather, you know, with over a hundred people, you know, in large gatherings, it's, you know, we, we take it, we take it for granted that adults will do the right thing and, and uh, wear the mask when you need to, when, when it's appropriate. And uh, so anyway, uh, let me turn it over to Chief Thornburg and he's going to give you some data and some, uh, some stats from, from this district. Thank um, you, Sheriff. Uh, thank you, Sheriff. And thank you, uh, Supervisor Phillips for inviting us and uh, allowing me to share some of the stuff that's going on. Um, we do, uh, for those of you that do know, um, we do get a fair amount of calls on, on Love Party. That's not necessarily the, the number one call we get. Our um, over 2000, uh, the, or 2020, I should say, up till uh, today, our primary call in District 2 is what we would call just a, uh, a general 911 call. Okay. And during those, we'll get, um, it, it could cover any number of things. We got about 45,000 calls last year. Um, and now that's just going to be in North County. Okay, that's uh, for those of you who don't know, the sheriff's office operates out of three stations. We have our North County station, which is located in Salinas, and then we have Coastal and South County. And I'm referring to the numbers I'm giving you is just uh, our North County. Um, burglary is by far our number one crime. Uh, that's true in North County as well as other parts of the county, followed by uh, any other type of theft that you might think of, whether it be uh, from a vehicle or petty theft from a residence or uh, or thefts from uh, uh, businesses. So uh, by far, that's our biggest one. Uh, outside of that, um, as far as the noise complaints go, uh, I know it can be a hot topic. It has been in North County for a little while. I, I remember you know, 18 years ago driving a patrol car around and we went to, to loud party calls. So uh, what happens when that comes in? I can tell you, we uh, we have identified one residence that we've been to uh, several times um, and, and going through the data and, and chopping through the data. And I get that uh, the loud party, uh, or loud music complaints every Monday. Uh, we pull them from 911. Uh, that's why if for those of you, uh, most of our calls come in through 911. We do occasionally get uh, an online tip about uh, loud party calls and we do go. Um, now, with all the other calls that we do handle, it may not necessarily be the first one we get to, but we do everything we can to to answer them. Some of the challenges that we face, uh, we get you know, North County has a lot of canyons, San Miguel Canyon Road and, and so on and so forth. And up in the Los Lomas area and the Pajaro area, you know, we do get those calls. Uh, the leading areas for Loud Party are going to be San Miguel Canyon and the surrounding areas there, you know, Paradise, so on and so forth, and then the Los Lomas area. Um, and looking at it, we get a lot of somebody calls in and says that the party is in the area of and gives a, a general description of where it is. Uh, deputies will go. We, we go to the vast majority of them. We don't make it to everyone, 
but when they get there, they, they, they struggle to try to figure out where the party is coming from. And people hear it because it echoes through those canyons and, and up and down. And when we do find the parties, we do contact the folks. Now, generally what happens when a deputy sheriff goes to these is they contact the homeowner and they say, listen, hey, somebody called about the music and, you know, can you turn it down? Uh, vast majority of the time, or I would say almost every time when the deputy's there, they turn it down. And then uh, depending on the history, you know, our deputies in North County have been working in North County for a while. They know if they've been to a certain residence. They know, um, if you will, the, the usual suspects in this particular case. Uh, and if they feel a, a referral is necessary, they'll generate a report. And that report goes to RMA, which enters, um, or excuse me, issues the fines. Because if they've set up tents, if they have the loud music, if they have porta potties and that, that sort of thing, um, they have to have permits. And we do refer those to RMA. RMA does send out um, referrals or fines, if you will, uh, to those folks. Now, just because we go to a loud party call, it doesn't necessarily mean that it generates that fine. Uh, we've been to, I know with COVID and everything, the parties we go to, we run into issues where we're running into a deputy sheriff at 6 p.m. is going to a party and it turns out to be a 15-year-old's birthday party or a 10-year-old's birthday party or it's a religious gathering or, you know, all of these we run into. We run into a wedding, you know, um, you know, they were the very beginning stages of a wedding. So we do educate them about the, the noise ordinance. We do educate them and we have been for the last year about uh, COVID and COVID enforcement and the requirements. Um, you know, depending on what time of year it was, it was different requirements, whether it was the state uh, lockdown or the local uh, from Dr. Moreno and the health department, what those requirements are and, and how they can uh, comply with those. So as far as uh, the number of calls in, uh, coming in, um, you know, I shared with that, we have about 45,000 calls last year um, and a call for services, anything a deputy sheriff might go to. And one of the things we struggle with the loud party calls is you know, we go and we have folks who um, we what we don't want to do is end up in a use of force. We don't want we're not um, our focus is not to arrest everybody at the party and take them off to jail. We don't have uh, the resources for that type of enforcement action, which is why we selected and why we've chosen to go with the noise ordinance as it was rewritten. And, and that, that did help those have changes in there were helpful for us to be able to um, seek a remedy to, to, you know, to make it as, as quiet as we can and to address the, the, the common violators, if you will, that come up for noise ordinance. Um, we'll continue to address those. We work very well with RMA and the code enforcement folks and uh, the deputies do write and do send them over. So, um, you know, with that, uh, I'm open to any questions. I, We've been monitoring the Q&A and, and look forward to answering anybody's questions and, and hope the information that we provided is helpful. Thank you, Chief. Um, one, one thing I'd, I'd, like to, I'd, I'd like to just address one question that was on the Q&A and in regards to speeding vehicles on San Miguel Canyon, and I'm sure Captain Foster is going to address that, but uh, the sheriff's office, we, we're typically, although we do enforce traffic, it's, you know, it's typically like speeding or running a stop sign or something that occurs in front of us. But our, our main area of expertise is penal code crimes. And, and we have an agreement with the California Highway Patrol uh, that they, uh, they tackle the, the traffic uh, vehicle code crimes on the roads. Uh, so any if we if we pull over somebody who's suspected of DUI, for example, we will uh, once we determine that they're probably under the influence, we will call CHP since they're the experts in in DUI. Uh, we will call them to come take over and and take over that investigation for DUI. Uh, and likewise, if there's a, a penal code crime on the freeway on, on on any roadway, we will we will take those. So that's that's the difference between uh, the sheriff's office and CHP. So uh, I'm sure Captain Foster will get more into the into the CHP side of it here. But thank you all. I, again, I can't wait to where we can meet in person once again. Thank you, Sheriff. That's a good segue into uh, Highway Patrol. We got uh, Captain. Kyle Foster with us. He's the area commander. And I got to say, since um, he's taken over, uh, we see a lot of them out here in North County. Uh, he's been really uh, responsive to our requests and concerns. And he, he also played a big role in the investigation of the 
projectile guy uh, defendant, and I understand they're getting pretty close to a plea agreement on that. I was talking to the district attorney to, today about it, but uh, uh, <laughs> uh, with that, um, Captain Foster, um, enjoy hearing your comments, please. Thank you, Supervisor Phillips. And once again, echoing what the sheriff said, thank you everyone for attending this evening. Um, as Sheriff Renal stated, the Highway Patrol and the Sheriff's Office have a great relationship. We work in concurrent jurisdictions, so we handle crimes in, in the <laughs> same areas, which is all District 2. Um, our biggest focus, uh, like the Sheriff said, though, is traffic. And unfortunately, District 2 has a majority of our traffic-related fatalities in the county and a lot of our traffic complaints. So last year, we investigated 528 crashes uh, in District 2. 19 of those were fatal collisions, five involving suspected DUI drivers. This year, we've had 79 crashes and one fatal uh, with a suspected DUI. Um, to uh, address these issues, we were very fortunate through the Office of Traffic Safety that we received a $200,000 grant last year for this uh, current fiscal year, so July through October um, for the grant cycle. Uh, we have been out to District 2 40 times since October 1st using our grant funded overtime to address speeding vehicles. Since October 1st to March 1st, we've issued 1,032 citations, speeding citations in District 2 alone. Um, over 243 were on San Miguel Canyon, 386 were on Highway 1, 163 of those were on San Juan Road, and 124 were on US 101. This is outside of our normal enforcement operations. This is just the specific targeted enforcement we've done to try to reduce injury and fatal collisions in your district. Um, the biggest concerns we have is based upon the roadway design and the volume of traffic. We're really asking for the community's assistance in one, slowing down. You know, If you see an unsafe behavior, please report it to my office and we'll make sure we get someone out there to uh, work a traffic complaint or provide additional support. But two, uh, really educating your friends and family, uh, your loved ones about the dangers of driving while impaired. Uh, 2020 with the pandemic really exposed our community to a significant increase in both drunk driving and drug driving, both uh, illicit narcotics and prescription drugs. Um, and so that education and looking after your loved ones is big in reducing roadway deaths. Um, the other thing we're working with the sheriff's office on is uh, they've invited the highway patrol to participate on their vehicle theft task force, uh, MADCAT. And uh, our two agencies, along with Salinas Police Department, have been doing a fantastic uh, job trying to recover stolen vehicles throughout the entire county. Um, so I appreciate the sheriff inviting us to that and allowing us to participate on that task force. Um, but with my office, if there's anything that we can do for District 2, if there's additional traffic complaints you'd like us to work, please again call us. Our number is 831-770-8000, um, and we'll always be able to be responsive to you. Uh, if there's any questions, just get us in the Q&A. And with that, Supervisor Phillips, thank you, sir. Well, thank you, uh, Captain. I got to say, uh, uh, the Highway Patrol, uh, Captain uh, Foster in particular, anytime uh, we have an issue out here and get a call, uh, him and his people are, are here. So, um, and I, I wanted to mention a few little things uh, before we get to Randy Ishii. Uh, uh, you know, we talk about G12, the San Miguel, where, where we have 25, 26,000 cars a day on G12. So we recently made some improvements uh, the San Miguel and Morro Road and the Pork Chop, as we call it, uh, turn area. Um, and uh, very shortly, we expect to receive a new high visibility pylons to make those turn lanes even more visible and reduce the likelihood of people trying to make the illegal turn uh, back onto San Miguel. Uh, on the other end of it, we had a, uh, at Fruitland Avenue, uh, we had a, a, a major uh, redesign, which uh, here helped traffic flow. I had good reports from there to the area and more importantly has made it uh, a lot safer for our residents up there. In Casterville, we're in the barking on a Cooper Street in Casterville uh, near the middle school is being resurfaced. Plus we're improving the curbs and intersections as well. As to road improvement uh, project in our area, uh, we are designing uh, in the design and, and planning phase of the new Casterville uh, Boulevard interchange uh, at the, uh, and, and that will, uh, should start uh, 
uh, construction and towards the end of 2020. Uh, Merritt Street is also getting a complete overhaul and will uh, get a completely resurfaced uh, working with Caltrans, uh, including get new sidewalks and look for more uh, Main Street uh, the drivers. Uh, another important change in Casterville is the new Hartnell campus. Uh, I don't know whether any of you, but most of you, have, if you're around this area, probably driven by and seen this, but it's uh, the accessible college in Casterville will make it uh, so much better for the North County students and really provide a better, more equitable access to learning in North County. Uh, other important going on is uh, uh, the Pajaro Levy. Uh, and we've made uh, more progress on that than we were had in the last 40 or 50 years. And we received funding from the US Army Corps of Engineers. And we've been working with, uh, especially with uh, Congressman Panetta's office to make sure that happens. Uh, and December last year, or December last year, we had a, a, a week-long cleanup on the levee and removed tons of trash, including abandoned cars and boats, and discovered that uh, they had tunnels and uh, increased uh, level of uh, things. Uh, uh, trash pickup, we mentioned uh, Smith and Enright, and maybe uh, uh, Randy can talk about that a little bit. Uh, uh, we've I also, any of you that are interested in doing a, an organized neighborhood cleanup, uh, my office will help work that work that with uh, Randy. Uh, we can make sure we get the vests and the pickup utensils and the road warning signs and the trucks out there to make that happen. And the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, we get a lot of complaints about the homeless encampment in Prunedale up on the overpass. Uh, I just want to let you know, uh, a lot of office uh, get complaints, but uh, that's Caltrans property and they won't let us on there uh, to do any cleanup uh, until COVID is over. And so we have a uh, no knock uh, uh, order. So with that, uh, Randy's been with us. How many years you've been with us now, Randy? Going on three, Supervisor Phillips. All right, well, he's doing a, a hell of a job, I gotta say. He's And he's a new public works facilities and park director. So Randy, uh, you can wind it down. Thank you very much, Supervisor Phillips, for the introduction and for the invitation to tonight's town hall with the community. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as our name implies, we're the Department of Public Works, Facilities and Parks. And so anything that you have transportation related that's public works, such as the roads and bridges, falls under uh, our shop. Uh, any county building also is part of our operations and maintenance. And finally, our county parks, such as Royal Oaks Park, just to name one of the, the parks, is a, a park facility at which we maintain for you, our constituents. Um, Supervisor Phillips gave an excellent summary of the kinds of projects we have already have been doing. And as we do our projects, we do them in partnership with our close partner, the CHP, the Sheriff's Office. Uh, we work very collaboratively with the Environmental Health Bureau on uh, trash litter abatement and health related matters, as well as the community as a whole when it comes to our projects. Uh, as Supervisor Phillips mentioned, there's safety projects that we're trying to do coupled with CHP activity related to the G12 corridor. There was the study that was conducted uh, in partnership with TAMC, Caltrans, and the county a couple of years ago. And at uh, the Board of Supervisors concurrence, We've applied for uh, state and federal grant monies to make some of those projects from that study come to reality. Uh, an area of focus that the Capital Improvement Committee directed staff on, which Supervisor Phillips sits on, was the segment one and segment six. And that's segment one is that area of San Miguel Canyon Road by US 101 up through Castroville Boulevard. And segment six is through the community of Pajaro. We applied for multi-million dollar grants from the states and the feds, and we're waiting to hear back on uh, how we rank compared to the other people who applied for these funds. But in the interim, we uh, performed some interim safety projects that merge with uh, the planned capital safety project that was in the G12 study. So these are near-term things we have for right now. Stay tuned, we're, we're applying for funding, we're looking for funds, to make the master plan improvements come to reality for the public and make the driving experience safer. And some other road improvement activities that we have been doing 
include the Measure X funded community street repair program in Castroville. Uh, we, this is a program and we started off with the program on Cooper Street by the middle school West Demerit. Since it's a program, we're gonna be doing a road year after year after year throughout the community as part of that program. And it includes the communities of Pajaro, Shular, and Baranda. Uh, there's some other planned capital projects we have, such as the Monterey Bay San Jose Scenic Trail um, out in Moss Landing that we are still in design phase on. And that's a project mostly funded by various state grants as well as a Coastal Conservancy grant. Uh, and there's also other traffic safety projects that we're doing uh, throughout the entire county. Uh, I'll pause there for a moment and shift gears towards uh, our general maintenance activity. Uh, our crews are the ones out there who are patching potholes, uh, picking up uh, any trees that are in the road right away, or when we get a call to provide support to emergency responders, the crew goes out there to put the traffic control in place, usually in the form of detours and road closures. Uh, our road crews are the ones who do that. We have four different yards, and the yard that serves at North County is located off of San Miguel Canyon Road, known as our Prunedale Yard. So what we ask of you is that if you see something, please say something. You're our constituents and our eyes on the ground, and if you see something, please let us know and we'll respond to it. And at the end, which, uh, thank you, of the last slide, which, uh, Monica has brought onto the screen. This is th the three different ways to get a hold of us. Um, you can either call us at that phone number that you see. You can send us an email at the email address that you see on the screen, or you can contact us through the Monterey County Connect app, uh, available free from the app stores. And again, please please provide us as much information about the road issue or the issue in the park that you see, uh, the best location that you possibly can maybe tie it back to an intersection. And um, or if you notice an issue in one of our county buildings, please also use those same means to let us know about it and we'll uh, assess and re react to it as quickly as we can. So I wanna take a moment to talk about the litter abatement program. We recognize uh, as a county as a whole that litter slash illegal dumping has become an issue. And, and since COVID, uh, our partners at the Health Bureau can attest that they've seen a rise in the amount of illegal dumping that's been occurring throughout the entire communities. And it's not just one spot, it's an exacerbation, a worsening of the hot spots we've already had. And now the problem seems to be growing and creeping out into other areas that it didn't exist before. So recognizing that the, the board and with collaboration with the Waste Authority uh, through uh, means of funding in which they've been able to provide have created this joint program that, again, the Waste Authorities provided some additional funding to, and the Public Works and the Health Bureau have teamed together with the contractor, Smith and Enright, to perform uh, the illegal dumping cleanup. Uh, right now, the Health Bureau is, uh, has taken the initiative on the program with its pilot, and Public Works will be taking over after that. We have our standard litter guard and litter abatement crews, but our, our crews are not of a size that can ta tackle as large as this problem has now become. So to address this issue, as I mentioned, the board's created this program. And at this point in time, please contact us through the same means of giving us a call, shooting us an email, or contacting us through Monterey County Connect on uh, the location of the litter issue. And what we're going to do not only is not only re respond and react to that location, we're cataloging that and adding it to our list of hotspots. So as the, as the program continues, we'll be using the contractor Smith and Enright to start doing a, a patrol around through these hotspot areas, much in the same fashion that our uh, county litter crews do, but it's, it's now at an augmented scale and they have the equipment, they have the staffing, uh, and they have the connections to be able to address our litter abatement problem and augment what we at the county are already able to provide. And, and I, I, I think that's really important, Randy, because it, it, if you don't get it picked up right away, then it becomes a hot spot and more people come and dump and dump and dump. Uh, so I, 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 that's really important that we, that we do are vigilant about it. 
uh, and as well as your numbers that you provide and the other means of doing it. Uh, the other thing is they can always call my office if, uh, if need be, or if they're here in Castleville, they can drop by and tell us where it is. So I uh, appreciate that. Appreciate it. Thank you, Randy. Um, so that kind of winds us up. Well, I've been here just chatting. Um, uh, you, you all have been working. Uh, how many uh, questions that we got answered, uh, uh, Monica? I think we have over 60 questions that have been answered by our panelists in the chat. All right. Um, it's about our time, but uh, any unanswered questions that we uh, need to get to? Uh, yes, actually, uh, Kate Sawyers has, has been very patient. Um, Kate, I do see your hand up. I'm going to give you the ability to talk. And you should be able to unmute now. So Kate Sawyer, go ahead. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Yes. Well, I, I, I apologize. I hit the button wrong. I don't really have anything to, to, uh, to say at the meeting. I do want to just make a comment that this meeting has been very informative, uh, much more than I even thought it was going to be. It answered a lot of my questions. So I'm really happy. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. We don't, we don't get people calling in telling us we did a good job too often. <laughs> so th th thank you. Uh, yeah, we have a couple it. more questions here. I'm sorry to interrupt sure. you, Supervisor. Um, okay, so we have uh, Mayor Kimberly Craig here. So I am going to unmute you, Kimberly. Uh, let's see here. Give me one second. Okay, Mayor, you can talk now. Hi, everyone. I uh, just wanted to acknowledge um, a great meeting tonight by Supervisor Phillips. I do know uh, part of Supervisor Phillips' uh, district overlaps into the city of Salinas, and so certainly want to make myself available to your North Salinas residents, as well as if anyone has any questions about the city of Salinas. Uh, my number is 831-758-7201. Uh, That's 758-7201. Um, and just really appreciate the constant collaboration between uh, North County and North Salinas in trying to solve some of the bigger issues with homelessness and garbage. So thank you, Supervisor Phillips, you're doing a great job and, and really uh, just wanna let uh, the residents of Salinas know that we're available for any questions or concerns. Thanks. Maybe we send all the problem calls to your number. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm work. getting a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Appreciate Thank you. your time. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have, it looks like Kate Sawyer's your hands up, but I'm not sure if it's still up. Um, I also have um, Alex Rivera. I'm going to allow you to talk. You should be able to do that now. You could unmute yourself and start speaking. Hello, everyone. Just wanted to say hello. Uh, just wanted to thank the office of Supervisor Phillips office for all the um, hard work and dedication you guys have been doing for North Monterey County, Castro community and everything you guys have been able to do for us. I also want to thank um, Felipe with waste management. I know it's a tough meeting to come into when everybody's kind of out there, uh, you know, we're kind of divided is what I see. What we should be is is uh, together. You know, that's the only way we're ever going to combat the situation. I believe that we're going to take uh, necessary steps to be able to take care of everything that's going on right now. Uh, in regards to litter abatement, I know Castro Rule has been, uh, in our community, has been really on it. And with your guys' help, of course, it's uh, it's become a better place to live. And I can tell you guys that. And I know you guys get, you know, you guys don't get too many of these, of these conversations where people are out there thanking you guys. But Definitely from the bottom of my heart, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, I know our residents are a little bit more excited about what Castro looks like and what it's been looking like, uh, but it takes a, a community effort, whether it's Castro, uh, whether it's Prunda, whether it's Alcorn, I think it's time for us to, to join forces and being able to bridge these gaps that we've, uh, we've lived so long. And I think it's uh, necessary now that more than ever that we, we do combine as a community because we, you know, we, we do have strength in numbers. We do have um, a lot of our kids wind up at the same high school. So I, I think it's one of those type of situations now that, you know, we need to relay and, and we, need to, we need to act like a, a community. All right. Thank you, Alex. And I, I, I do want to recognize Alex has been leading the, the cleanup uh, campaigns here in Casserville and, and is organized and uh, 
I, I went out there a couple of times to buy everybody uh, ice cream or something uh, to thank them for the work they do. And he, he had a heck of an organization. They really uh, care about their community and want to want to see it uh, upgraded and looking a lot better. So thank you for your uh, hard work that you're doing for the community. Thank you again for all your guys' support. Monica, anything else? Um, I just want to remind those of you that are calling in that you can raise your hand uh, with star nine and then you can mute and unmute yourself with star six. So star nine to raise your hand. Um, I'm going to look in the Q&A and see if there's any more questions that do need to be. Yep, nope, everybody's doing a great job answering questions there. Um, so uh, um, Mayor Craig, it looks like your hand is still up. I'm not sure if you have an additional comment. Um, I will allow you to speak. Um, if you would like. Nope, that's an old hand. That's all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So I, I, so I think we're good. Um, I, I just wanted to mention that we are able to um, provide the slides if you have any questions after, um, after the meeting. Um, and Supervisor Phillips. Yeah, I just, uh, two things. I want to thank all of you for taking your evening uh, to spend a little time and, and, uh, uh, get with our citizens and hear what their concerns and, and try to uh, reach out to them so they they know uh, what the county's doing for them. Uh, and I thank all the people who joined this uh, uh, little town hall meeting. And uh, I hope we were answered some questions. And like I said, if you think of something that we didn't deal with or anything, call my office and we'll get it directed to the right person and get an answer for you. So with that, thank you again. Have a good evening. Thank you, Supervisor. Be safe, everyone. Thank you.